Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to thank you uh, again for joining us today on the program, and I, I trust that you have been tuning in every week as we continue to unpack probably one of the most difficult uh, subjects uh, and probably one of the most divisive subjects. We really are, intention is not to be divisive at all, but simply to offer an alternative to a lot of the fear that's being offered out there uh, on, you know, a lot of different venues. Uh, so we simply are, are truth seekers. Our heart is to seek the truth and uh, to give it to you as we believe God said it to us, and then you've got the human prerogative to eat the grapes and spit out the seeds. I trust you enjoyed the last nine weeks with uh, Dr. John Noe was on with me, and uh, we, we uh, over that period of nine weeks, I believe, laid out a timeline that, that I believe was pretty conclusive, and thank you so much for your response to those programs. And uh, if you missed any of them, uh, you can go back and watch them again on YouTube. We have everything that we have aired to date, especially for the last probably two years, available to you, maybe even longer than that, but they're available to you on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can go to YouTube and simply Google my name or that you might have life and it will bring up that channel and you can watch them at any time. Uh, there are several churches that are using these videos as a teaching uh, for their service on Wednesday night that provokes a, a lot of times some, uh, you know, some dialogue. Uh, you know, really, uh, I I'm not trying to convince you of every detail of this because the details can change very based upon, you know, maybe whoever's teaching in the sense of some of the minute details. I think that uh, very clearly we have laid out for you that uh, uh, most of the biblical last days are not in your future, they're in your past. It was the last days of uh, uh, Ju uh, Judaism. It was the last days of an old covenant system. Uh, that to me is a powerful piece to get a hold of because if you don't understand that, you will not understand that we are truly truly in a new covenant. Uh, once again, let me just say to you, you can not only go back to that, but you can subscribe uh, to our iTunes and get a podcast. That podcast will give you delivered to your device every week uh, the audio file of these programs where you can listen to them again and again. And we encourage you to go sign up for that and then follow us also on our public profile page on Facebook. Uh, the last several weeks, like I said, let me just get into the Word, but we've been just unpacking this book of Revelation and while uh, we're, in this, we're still in the sixth chapter of Revelation, still dealing with some things, and I'm going to start there again uh, today and just kind of, uh, kind of show you again where some of the things that Jesus had prophesied were fulfilled. Now, I'm going to start by reading to you from the sixth chapter of Revelation, and this is from the King James Version, chapter 6, verse 1 says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given to him that, there, that uh, sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld an low black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of meal, or I'm sorry, three measures of barley uh, for a penny, and see thou hurt not uh, the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was called Death, and hell followed after him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beast, and a uh, beast of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, and I probably uh, won't get to the fifth seal on this program, uh, but we'll come back and, and, and perhaps uh, get it. But let me just go ahead and read the chapter so we have it. But it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them, that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. 
And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell uh, of the heaven, fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, of the, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks, and in the mountains, and said, unto to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For, great, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Now what I want to do with that is I want to compare that with the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24 uh, when he be, he's giving, remember, now we dealt with this a little bit last week, but remember he's giving his most dramatic prophecy. And he's standing there, he had just, uh, you know, prophesied several woes on, in Matthew 23 to the scribes and to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders that were standing there. And he said to them, you are the ones who testify that you have killed uh, the prophets and stoned them that were sent to you so that upon this generation will come the blood of all that were slain from the blood of righteous Abel until the blood of Zechariah. So Jesus was telling them that all of the judgments that was coming was going to come upon that generation in Matthew chapter 23. And then he comes over and Matthew 24, and the context is he begins to lay this out and says to them, he says to them, uh, as he's standing there in front of all these beautiful buildings of the temple. Now remember the context, he's standing there in front of the temple and he said, do you not see all these things? And then he begins to prophesy and says, not one stone is going to be left upon another which shall not be thrown down. And, uh, you know, then he begins to tell them, uh, uh, he says, uh, you know, take heed that no man will deceive you. This is Matthew 24, verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Note that. Uh, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows, King James says. Another translation says all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. And then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let whoso readeth, let him understand. Let him which is in Judea flee into the mountains. Now let me just tell you that everything to me is context relevant. If I was to sit here today and say to you, uh, folks, the end is near. God is about to send a flood of rain. It's about to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the word of God declares to us that we must build an ark to the saving of our household. And we must begin to gather so that we can, you know, bring animals of every sort on this boat. And, and I started to preach to you like that. And I started to preach that as something relevant to you right now in your time slot. I could literally tell you and pull it out of the scripture and say, look, folks, this is what the scripture says is going to happen at the end of the world. And I preach that, you would probably write to me and say, you are crazy, Brother House, because that scripture is not relevant to my time slot. It was relevant to Noah's time slot. Now, can I submit to you uh, that, you, you know, you, you consider this yourself, but Jesus is talking to an audience in Matthew chapter 24, and the things that he is saying to them is very relevant to that time slot. And for me to pull the events and the prophecies that he's saying to this particular generation, because he gives, he limits a time text 
in the 34th verse of Matthew 24 when he says, this generation will not pass to all these things be fulfilled. And not only does he say that in Matthew 24, he says that in Matthew 23, that upon the scribes and Pharisees that he prophesied, I believe it was six woes, he said that uh, upon that, that, that all the blood that was shed uh, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias would come upon that generation. When you understand the time relevancy and the context of these scriptures, without any gaps, without any gimmicks, without any, uh, you know, uh, uh, hermeneutical gymnastics to make it fit somewhere out in our future, it becomes very relevant uh, to what was taking place right here in this generation. And this is one of the prophecies that was probably the most, you know, I mean, of all the prophets that ever prophesied, surely when Jesus spoke these things, he was not a false prophet. So if he said this generation uh, would not pass to all these things, that all of this would come upon this generation. And not only does he say that uh, in Matthew 24, he says that in several places, once again, throughout the scripture, he says things like, you will not have finished going through the cities of Jerusalem until the Son of Man become. And there are some of you standing here which shall not taste of death. Do you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom? To Caiaphas, he would say, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And what we're trying to do is help you understand in the paradigm of the early Hebrew mindset that these were not strange concepts. They were, they understood completely what was going on. But what we do is we, it's almost as if I took the story of Noah and took it completely out of context and started preaching it's going to rain and there's going to be a flood, folks. Uh, you know, uh, that's just so out of context. So are these things. I believe one of the things that's going to help us is that we, we understand that a lot of the doomsday stuff that we've coming where the sky is falling is not in our future at all. It is behind us. And I think at the, some point when we shift our thinking uh, from that kind of a paradigm to, a, uh, to a, 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 an understanding that, that God didn't just leave us here to survive, but he left us here to thrive and to make disciples of all nations. See, one of the things that Jesus said is all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. He gives Adam in Genesis chapter 1, his original man, he gives him a dominion mandate uh, to, to have dominion and to sub, literally to subdue the earth. He tells them in Daniel, and uh, you know, we'll get with some of these uh, things in the book of Daniel as we continue to be, preach from the book of Revelation, but he tells us in the book of Daniel that uh, the beast would wear out the saints until a judgment would set. I submit to you, if you go back into the book of Daniel and you read those things, especially if you read those chapters in the Amplified Bible, it will talk to you about the digression of the kings that would be that would come to pass that Daniel was prophesying would come somewhere in their future. Because when Daniel even, listen, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel prophesies concerning the dream, or he, not, he doesn't prophesy, he is giving the king the interpretation to his dream. And when he starts to give him the interpretation to the dream, he says, you, O king of Babylon, you are uh, the king, the first king. And he sees this great big image. He sees this great big uh, image that has, uh, you know, a head of gold and, a, and it's got feet of fine brass and it's got a, a breastplate, but it's got, uh, you know, uh, these uh, kingdoms. And uh, Daniel begins to describe that, and he says that what's going to happen is, uh, he says, King of Babylon, you're the first king. You're the head of gold. And then he says, after you is going to rise another king. That second king that arose was Darius the Mede. He followed immediately upon the heels of the king of Babylon. And then after him, he said, will arise another. He said, the Greeks under the rulership of Alexander the Great. Now, if you go back, and you can see this in the Amplified Bible. It'll actually translate which kings it was. He said, but the fourth kingdom is going to be, uh, it's going to have, you know, toes that are part of iron and part of clay. And he said, they're going to, it's going to, uh, you know, uh, be part of iron and part of clay. They'll not cleave together. But the, that, that kingdom, uh, Daniel goes on to describe, was the kingdom of Rome. Now it is the Romans who are in control during the days when Jesus comes on the scene, the Jews are in Roman captivity under the rulership of these kings. 
Now what Daniel said would happen, he's telling the king, I believe it is King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he said, here's the things that are going to, what God has showed the king is what is going to occur in the latter days or the last days. Now let me say again to you that the last days are not in your future. They were the last days of that old covenant. And he's showing the king what was going to take place in those last days. And when he begins to describe that, he says that there's going to be this digression from the king of Babylon to Darius the Mede to Alexander the Great and then the Romans. And then when he begins to describe this, what he says is simply this, and and I believe it is in verse 45 of Daniel chapter 2, which is in the latter part anyway, he said that the great God has made known to the king what's going to happen in the latter times. And then he goes on to say, he said, but during the days of these final ten kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall not be destroyed, and the kingdom will not be left to other people. I submit to you that God began to establish his kingdom from the time that Jesus was born, because the king had now come on the scene. He was in Daniel chapter 2, the rock that was cut out of the mountain without hands that would smite the image of this beast and then would become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. That's not, that's not uh, hard to wrap your head around, is that the kingdom of God, what he's saying is that the kingdom of God is going to come on the scene at that period of time, and it's going to continue to be organic and grow until it fills the whole earth. I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is on the advancement right now. Listen, I'm not going to preach a losing Jesus. I believe that the earth is the Lord's of the fullness thereof, and I believe the sooner the church wakes up and realizes that the dominion and the right to rule it belongs to God's people, the more we're going to see this thing turn around. There's some real problems in the earth right now, but I'm going to tell you the responsibility that God has laid on the church to disciple nations is, I believe, one of our mandates that we've laid down. And as a result, we've lost our culture. We've lost our kids. We've lost our influence. But I believe there's a rebound coming. I believe the Lord is raising us up uh, to wake up some folks to the present reality of the kingdom and to our purpose and our destiny in the earth. Because what God is interested in is not just getting me saved so I could live 70 years in misery. And then one of these days I get to go home and go to heaven. What he did was he saved us. He redeemed us because the business that we are to be about is the Father's business of establishing the kingdom. If you will seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things are added to you. Probably the kingdom is one of the least preached on subjects in the church around the world. And when we do preach on the kingdom, we preach on it like it is some distant planet somewhere out there three miles south of Mars when the kingdom of God is not somewhere out there. The kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is progressing. It is like leaven. It must continue until the whole thing is leaven. Because that's what Daniel saw when he saw these kings. And he said, during the days of these kings, the God of heaven. Listen, that's not my opinion. That's what your Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which would not be destroyed and the kingdom would not be left to other people. Then you come on over to Daniel chapter 7 to Daniel chapter 9, and it says, but what would happen is that this beast and this same beast, if you go back and you read it in the Amplified Bible, it takes a whole lot of the research out of it for you because he just simply shows you who these kings were historically, and they were the same kings that were in power during this uh, particular season uh, from... 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. and during this reign and this uh, period of time in which the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom was being preached and uh, uh, it was being declared around the world. And you know, let me just say this while I'm at, at, at thinking about this. Uh, when he says this in Matthew 24, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. That's not uh, a, a scripture that's talking about if you can hold on and not backslide. If you just hold on and not black backslide, you know, uh, and you endure to the end, you're going to be saved. Uh, I, while I do believe that you need to hold on, uh, what he's talking about was if you endure to the end, he was talking about a redemption that was drawing nigh as this whole system of the law was about to be passed off of the scene. Animal sacrifice was about to be destroyed. Persecution was heavy upon these people. And he's saying to them, if you can endure to the end, the end of what? To the end of that age that was quickly and rapidly coming to an end, the 
the same will be saved. And one of the things that they were saved from was simply that judgment that was coming upon this apostate people. And many of them escaped the judgment anyway because they listened to the words of the prophecy of Jesus when he said, you, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, you'll know that it's not even at the door. And at that time, you're going to need to get, if you're in Jerusalem, you need to get out of here. Now, let me just go on to say to you what he goes on to say. Let, let me uh, uh, see if I can find this real quickly in the book of Daniel. Uh, because in, in, in the latter part of the book of Daniel, he's talking about in the days of these kings, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom uh, which would never be removed. But he also talks about that. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, hallelujah. Maybe not chapter nine. Maybe let me see here. Yeah, and uh, and uh, it talks about and, and, okay, in and, and chapter uh, number seven, verse thirteen, says, "I saw in the night visions. Behold, one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all." people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom which that shall not be destroyed. Now let me tell you that this is not talking about him physically coming in the clouds to get us. This is about him appearing before the Ancient of Days uh, when he uh, ascended up on high, and I believe that, you know, he came before the Ancient of Days, and he, the, you know, the, that he, uh, well, here, here it is. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. So he, he, he appears before the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And that's when God gave him dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and that all people, this is God's decree, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That tells me we win. That doesn't tell me we win for a little while, then we lose for a little while, and then Jesus comes back and we win again. That tells me that he established the kingdom, and he received his coronation as king here in the book of Daniel chapter 7, when he stood before the Ancient of Days, let me tell you, Jesus is not going to be king. He was born a king, and then he received power, dominion, all authority was given to him in heaven and earth when he ascended. And even when he comes back in Acts chapter 1 and begins to declare to his disciples, he says to them, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. He gives us that same power, that same authority, and that same dominion. Now let me come back down here, and, uh, and it says that these... Uh, verse 17 says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That's, that's powerful. And the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever. That's, that's, that includes us. Then I would know the truth of the four beasts, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were like iron, nails of brass, which were about breaking pieces, stamped the residue with his feet, the ten horns that were his head, and the other which came up before him, three fell, even uh, of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Behold, the same horn made war with the saints, prevailed against him, until... The Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. I submit to you that this judgment that he's talking about, that un he, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. I submit to you that this judgment is not in your future, but it's when Jesus was lifted up from the earth. He said, now is the judgment of this world come. Now is the prince of this world judged. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I'm telling you, I believe that was a judgment that was fulfilled, that then relinquished and God gave dominion and authority to us as the saints of the Most High to execute in the earth God's kingdom, God's judgment, God's, uh, God's favor. And it goes on to say uh, that uh, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed 
the kingdom. I think that's powerful. And I'll, I'll deal with some of this uh, uh, as we get into the beast even in Revelation. But uh, uh, let me just say this because we're about to run out of time here before too long. But God gave dominion to the saints of the Most High. God never took that back. God gave authority to tread on serpents to his people. He never took that back. He gave authority to heal the sick, to raise the dead. God never took that back. I wish we could wake the church up to be a people who would walk in the authority of the believer. See, you know, one of the things I appreciate about the Word of Faith movement was it had taught the believer his authority to be able to walk in authority and execute dominion. It's just that I think we've limited what we think that's for. It's not just to get a bigger house and a better car, but it is to bring the kingdom of God into the earth, into manifestation, uh, beginning clear back in these days of these kings with an ongoing progression for of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. You say, what are you saying, Brother House? I'm telling you that the kingdom of God is advancing and it is advancing at a rapid speed and you are part of that kingdom that is advancing. You you are either going to be part of the answer or you're going to be part of the problem. And I think what we think is what determines what we do in the earth. Wow. We've about run out of time and I didn't get very far in this segment, but uh, let me just say to you, take a moment to call that number on the screen, write to us. If you believe in what we're doing, listen to me, get behind us and support the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of his grace. We really need your help at this particular season. As you know, we are swimming against the tide seemingly. So if you believe in us, don't wait for someone else to do it. Call that number on the screen. You can sow a seed via credit card. You can go to our website, sign up to become a partner with us to partner to take this gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace around the world. We need your help. Do it in Jesus name and we will appreciate you for it. Thank you. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.